Allow me to share God's testimony about His love, grace, and faithfulness in our family. God has blessed me with a wonderful wife, Amy, and two grown-up children, Diane and Mark, who fear the Lord. In late evening of February 17, 2017, my wife and I accompanied our 34-year-old son, Mark David, to the hospital as he was experiencing high fever and chills. At the ER, he was diagnosed with dengue. But the next day, we were told it was pneumonia. At that time, his condition worsened, and by 11 p.m., he experienced unconsciousness for a few minutes. Code Blue was alarmed, and his condition became critical. As the doctors were trying to stabilize the condition of my son, I, asked, I was asked to step out of the room and made my way to the end of the corridor to pray. I asked God to heal my son completely with no complications and make him whole again. But if not, just take him home. When he was stabilized enough to be wheeled on a bed to the ICU, my son and I communicated through our usual hand signals since at that point, he could not talk. We both pointed our fingers towards heaven. Thumbs up as we approved an okay sign, which meant everything is and will be okay. With that exchange, I was completely comforted and assured that he was at peace and ready. I whispered in his ear that Jesus loves him and that we too love him. He blinked his eyes and smiled. On February 19, 2017, 2.22 p.m., Mark went home and joined his Creator. No more tears. No more pain. No more sickness. Truly in death, there is healing. As my family and I were slowly moving to the direction that God wanted us to take, but learning to live a new life without Mark was very difficult. In the beginning of 2019, my family once again experienced a heavy trial. My wife was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer of the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdominal cavity. The doctors suspected that it originated from the ovaries. It was an aggressive type of cancer. Upon learning about it, we did not understand what it was and did not know what to do. Our initial response was to pray and seek God's guidance, wisdom, and strength. We prayed for complete healing. We also prayed for God to lead us to a Christian doctor who can help us understand and approach the test with clarity. Later on, we were referred by my niece to a doctor who is her professor, who is also a surgical oncologist and happened to be a specialist on the type of cancer that my wife was diagnosed with. The Lord was clearly the one orchestrating step by step. The doctor is also a Christian who mentioned to us that medicine is not 100%. It is God who heals. Upon the completion of the diagnostic tests, the doctor scheduled my wife for an immediate surgery due to the severity of her case. The surgery was scheduled on the sixth day the diagnosis was confirmed. I asked the doctor, how should I prepare for this major operation and he replied, point blank, prepare 2.5 million pesos. I told him, I do not have such an amount, but my heavenly father has it. We purposefully did not tell people about the amount that was needed, nor ask for financial assistance, because we knew that the Lord will provide. We needed the amount in six days. The Lord completed the amount in four days. 
He moved and caused people to give. Fifteen days after the surgery, my wife got discharged. Six weeks thereafter, six cycles of systemic chemotherapy began. On July 20, 2019, six months after the surgery, my daughter and I brought my wife to the ER as she was experiencing pain on her abdomen, kept vomiting and was experiencing constipation. After a series of diagnostic tests, CT scan revealed adhesion in her small intestines. She was scheduled for an immediate surgery to avoid sepsis. Once again, the Lord showed how much of a father He is to us. He gave my wife healing and provisions. Thirteen days after the surgery, she was discharged, completely healed, and now cancer-free. She will, she will finish her last chemo session on Wednesday, September 25, 2019. All throughout our journey, we are choosing to honor and glorify God by sharing our stories about God's faithfulness and goodness in our lives. My wife, Amy, my daughter, Diane, and my son, Mark, and I are just participants in God's amazing story. I am Peter Dehesa, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise. Now, um, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, I am Mike, and I have been asked to uh, share this message with you today. And there's something so special about this message because I feel like it is something that all of us need to hear. Uh, we've been going through a series called what? Truth Matters, right? Everyone say truth matters. And especially as we have heard the story of Tito Peter and his family, truth matters most in times of hardship. What are you going to do when the storms of life, when the challenges that come upon us come your way? What are you going to do in times of hardship and suffering? How are you going to hold on to the truth? And this is why truth matters most in times of hardship. As we go through the second to the last message to the book of Acts, we will see Paul's journey going to Rome. As we begin our time here, why don't you take out your Bibles or turn on your Bibles through your phone in your app. And we will go today through Acts chapter 27, verse 1, to 28, chapter, uh, verse 10, right? We will go through Paul's journey. And if you've read this chapter at any point before, you will realize that Paul's journey was not an easy one. In fact, he faces three life-threatening situations. He faces a storm, a shipwreck, and even a snake bite all in one chapter. This is what Paul encounters on his journey. So as we go through this, how do you deal with situations that are outside of your control? Whether you're in a crisis or a calamity, how do you respond to these concerns and to these extreme conditions? Well, my message for you today is that if you find yourself in a storm today, this is it, that we all need to be courageous. Everyone repeat after me, be courageous. Be courageous, everyone, not because we want to show that we have it all together, not because we want to tell people, hey, hey, hey don't worry about me, I'm okay, I'll ride this out all together. No, we can be courageous because of a truth, because truth matters. And we can be courageous because of this all-encompassing truth that God is in control. Can everyone repeat that after me? God is in control. This is how we can have courage in the midst of our trials, that we can entrust our very lives unto the Lord because He is in control. Control. Pakisahay po sa God is in control. 
God is in control even today as He has brought you here. If you are our guest here, God is in control in that He allowed you to be here. There are not, no such things as, as accidents in the kingdom of God. Amen? That He has brought you here to hear this message. And so as we begin, we see that Paul's journey to Rome after he had been tried in Jerusalem, he is coming all the way from Caesarea, and now he is making his way all the way to Rome, Italy, where he has appealed before Caesar, right? So this journey takes about more than a little over one month, okay? But as we will soon find out in this chapter, it takes them about five to six months just to get to Rome. The delays, the hindrances, all of these things come upon Paul. It's not a walk in the park, folks. It's not a comfy ride. In fact, it's not convenient at all. But more often than not, life doesn't turn out as we plan it. Things can go wrong. Yes or no? Sometimes our expectations aren't fulfilled. A one-month journey can turn into several months, and that is why we need to study God's Word. We need to see how to navigate through the storms of life. And the whole anchor behind this chapter, as you will see it unfold today, the story or the essence of the story is this. This is the all-encompassing truth that God's providence is over Paul on his journey to Rome. Can everyone say this with me? God's providence. What is God's providence? It means that God is in control. It means that God is divinely and sovereignly orchestrating, directing, sustaining, and fulfilling His purposes in history, in human affairs, and yes, even in our own personal lives. That is God's providence for us, folks. In fact, some Christians have called this the hidden hand of God at work in our lives. Although we don't see it, He is at work in the background. He is orchestrating, outworking everything so that His purposes will be followed. And we will see this in the life of Paul as how God's providence guides him through. In fact, in Proverbs 16, 9, it says this, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We can make all of our plans, but it is God who directs our steps. Earlier, we sang how good, good father, right? We sang how God is our good father. And I just get this picture of God's providence that, you know what? When you have a toddler, right? When you have a baby who is learning how to walk for the first time, right? You, you understand that? how all, they're walking, they're wobbly, sometimes they fall, sometimes they stumble, and yet you always see their nearby parent. And what does the parent do? It's always there, like watching out, right? Okay, careful, careful. Oh, oh, oh. And then he catches them and then stretches them back again and then allows them to walk, right? That is a picture of God's providence over our lives, that we are not alone in this journey. That as we go through life, our Heavenly Father is guiding us along. This is God's providence. Everyone repeat after me, God's providence. So, the outline for today is simply this, that when we have storms, problems in our life, as we journey with God, we must realize that He has a plan, God's plan. Everyone say God's plan. And number two, we realize that God's presence is with us. Everyone say God's presence. And number three, that there is God's promise. God's promise. Everyone say it. And number four, that God's power will be revealed in our lives. God's power. Okay? All of these four aspects, these four Ps, will guide us into walking and journeying with God on this life. That no matter what faces us, we know and we have anchors in God's plan, presence, promise, and power. Are you ready to learn, brothers and sisters? All right, let's do it. God's plan. Let's discover God's plan over Paul's life. You know how Christians always say, you know what? God has a plan for you. My plan ang Panginoon para sa you. Right? We agree with that, yes? But when you ask them a second question, 
Well, what does that look like? What does God's plan actually look like in your life? Well, they'll say, I, uh, I, I don't know. Basta may, may plano si God. Bahala na siya doon. Right? That's how many Christians today are so unaware that God has made His plan explicit. And you can find that in the Scriptures. Right? That God has a plan for your life. And tanungin yung katabi nyo. Ask them, what is God's plan for your life? Do you know? Bakit po kayo nandito today? As you journey with God, what is God's plan for your life? What is God's will, right? And we find that actually in the anchor verse of the entire book of Acts. We have read this again and again. But again, let's read it all together. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. God has already revealed His plan for every Christian. And that is for us to have power through the Holy Spirit so that we can be witnesses, right? Our message last week was what? Be a faithful witness. So this is God's plan for us, that wherever we go, we are sharing, we are witnessing God's story in our lives. That is the plan, right? So any witnesses in the house tonight? Any witnesses? Can I get a witness? who are witnesses of God's divine plan in their lives, right? All of us are called to be a witness on to God. And in fact, look at this. In Acts 23, verse 11, we see God making this explicit to Paul. On the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side. Incredible. The Lord comes. The Lord Jesus comes to Paul and says, Take what? Courage. For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Jesus is telling Paul, hey, Paul, as you are being a witness, you will go to Rome. That's considered the remotest part of the earth, the ends. Rome was the seat of the Roman Empire. And when Paul reached Rome, he reaches the entire world. So that was God's plan for Paul. And what Jesus says to him is to take courage. Our message today, what again? Be courageous, for God is in control. You know, I remember not long ago, about four years ago, similar to the Dehesa's uh, testimony. Four years ago, my brother was diagnosed with cancer. That was a storm that all of our family faced. And if it were not for God and His plan, it would not have turned out well. You see... My brother was just like me. We had our past life. We would go against God. And yet, when my brother was diagnosed with cancer, he realized that God's plan was unfolding in his life. And it just so happened that God used that, that suffering to lead my brother to Jesus Christ. I remember our brothers and sisters from CCF who would do Bible studies with him, and he shared the gospel with him. So much so that even if he passed away after almost two years of battling it out, I could honestly attest to you that I will see him one day in heaven, that I will see my brother alive and well with Jesus. It was God's plan all along. So be courageous because why? God is in control. Be courageous. God is in control. So as we begin with the story today, we will just skim through this quickly. We see Paul's journey. It was decided that they would sail for Italy. And they proceeded to deliver Paul, some other prisoners, to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. So a centurion is a a commander of 100 people. And he was Augustan, meaning he was a special forces kind of centurion in charge of transporting prisoners. And we get this. They embark on a ship and then... Who were with Paul? Look at this, we and Aristarchus. This tells us that Paul was not alone on this journey. In fact, he had Luke, the gospel writer, right? And the writer of Acts. Luke, the physician, the doctor, was with Paul. And so was Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. This was a ministry companion of Paul, and he was not alone. In fact, it was unheard of 
for prisoners to have companions as they were transported, right? So God granted Paul these companions, these brothers in Christ to journey alongside him as he went to Rome. And this reminds me how important it is today that all of us, we walk with people. In fact, our scripture memory verse tells us, it us encourage one another as we go forth, right? And me, because I am the head of the men's ministry here in CCF, I just want to make this clear, brothers, that we cannot do this alone. Can I get an amen? That even Paul had Luke and Aristarchus. He had brothers in Christ who was willing to journey with him, even if it became dangerous. As we continue, right? The next day, we put it Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with what? Consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. Wow, praise God. God allowed Paul the favor from this centurion so that he can receive care after two years of being in prison, right? He, was, he probably had developed some sort of sickness. That's why Luke was with him. And look at this. From there, we put out the sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Uh-oh. Everyone say, uh-oh. We get a glimpse now that the winds were contrary. This is an ominous sign of what is to come the first sign of danger. So, so far, they make their way from Caesarea, coast to coast, and now they're here at Crete, okay? And the winds were already contrary. So many of us Christians, we walk, we follow God, we journey with Him, we go to church, we pray, we go to small group, and then finally, a storm comes. And all of a sudden, you don't know where you are. All of a sudden, the rains come and the lightning flashes. The waves rise and the storm begins. How many of you, you are in a storm today? Raise your hand. Do you want the 3D effects here at CCF Center? Right? Many of us, I tell you, we are in the storm today. Many of us, I tell you, as we go on in our Christian walk, you will either be in a storm, about to enter into a storm, or you're exiting a storm. Storms represent for us things that are outside of our control, things that happen to us beyond our expectations, beyond our plans. These are the storms that happen in any person's life. Now, as we continue in the story, when we sailed slowly for a good many days with what? Read this together. With difficulty and then arrived off Snydus since the wind did not permit us to go farther. You realize that a storm escalates slowly, difficulty first, and then you cannot move anymore. You cannot go further. And then look at this. With difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens. And when considerable time had passed, the voyage was now dangerous. Everyone say dangerous. These are the storms of life that come upon us, that they stop us. They're difficult to go through, and they cannot permit us to go farther, that it becomes dangerous at some point. In fact, Luke includes this detail since even the fast was already over. What is this fast he's talking about? This is the Jewish feast of Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement happened in October 5, according to our calendars. And if you study navigation history, to travel from October, November, December, January, February, March in the Mediterranean where they were coasting through, That is very, very dangerous. In fact, no ships, no vessels dared to sail in those times. So when Luke adds this detail, the fast was already over. Wow, October 5 and onwards. This is already dangerous for them to be on that ship in that sea. And so look at this. In the midst of the storm, Warren Wiersbe said this, a crisis does not make a person. In fact, a crisis shows what a person is made of. And it tends to bring true leadership to the fore. When a crisis hits you, 
it reveals who you are. When a problem faces you, when a challenge arises, it reveals to you who you really are. We can come to church and we can claim that we are Christians, that we pray and do all of these spiritual things. But when you're in the midst of a storm, that is when the rubber meets the road. That is when you are exposed. And we will see from Paul and from the other people how they respond to the storms. For Paul, it's true leadership. For the other people in the ship, we will see how they respond through this crisis. And look at Paul in the next line. Paul began to admonish them saying, let's all read this together. Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So this was something beyond their control. But Paul said, I perceive, right? This will happen. In fact, 2 Corinthians tells us that Paul had been shipwrecked not one, not two times, but how many times? Three times. So Paul already knew that the winds were contrary, that, uh uh-oh, this is going to go wrong, right? Did they listen? This is how they responded. But the centurion was more, what? Persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than but what was being said by Paul. Paul speaks what needs to be said, but they sailed anyway. You see, the centurion listened to the pilot and the captain. In his mind, mas marunong naman to eh. They're the professional sailors, right? They've been doing this. Who are you, Paul? You're just a prisoner, right? But sometimes, when we follow God's plan, it doesn't necessarily make sense on the onset. In the beginning, right? It doesn't make sense. But we follow by faith, right? So what happens next? So, because the harbor was not suitable for the wintering, the majority reached a decision. Look at this. How they responded to the storm? They followed the majority. What everyone else was saying, they followed that. And they put out to sea from there. See? What happens is when you follow the majority, you will think that it's the most wise and most correct decision. Just because every, everyone is doing it, it makes it right. Therefore, we should follow that. That's why today, our culture, our society is plagued by this. Whatever the majority is doing, let's follow that. You have people sleeping together before marriage because what? Everyone's doing it. You have people getting into a bad investment. Well, because my friends are getting into it, right? So we have this tendency in the midst of any situation to just go along with what the majority decides instead of going on what God has said, right? So the people on the ship, hey, they were like, oh yeah, let's continue. Let's voyage through. And look at what happens next. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, ayan na, my south wind, we can move forward, we can progress. They weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close in shore. What happens to them next? Do they reach the harbor? Well, boom, the storm enrages. Before very long, they're rushed down from the land. A what? Let's all read this together. A violent wind, right? A violent wind. This is a hurricane-like wind. This is a typhoon-like wind. And in fact, yung typhoon may pangalan. You're a kilo. It sounds like you're, you're killed, right? You're, you're kilo, <laughs> right? Even here in the Philippines, we have names for storms. And this storm was notorious because it had a name. This would be a north and southern wind that would come from the land and would boom, rush along all of the shipping vessels in that area. And look at this, verse 15 says, when the ship was caught in it, look at, notice how the storm, the typhoon unfolds. They could not face the wind. We what? Gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. And running under, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. What do you do when you feel like everything is out 
of control. Everybody say, out of control. When you are driven along by life's storms, by the crisis that hits you, what do you do? For many Christians, they don't know. They just carry along. They just coast with it. Bahala na, let's just go through this. But can I tell you? God is in control. And therefore, if any storm hits us, if any unexpected trial comes before us, we can be what? Courageous. Because God is in control. Sabihin sa katabi be courageous. Not be sleepy. Because God is in control. God permits all of these things because it is within His plan. In fact, um, as I was preparing for this message, I, I recounted not so long ago, just a few weeks ago, uh, me and my wife, uh, we have been married for three months now, praise God. Um, but on our second month, you know, when you're newly married, you know, everything is sweet and it's a honeymoon stage, right? And everything's nice and, and, and peaceful. And all of a sudden, on our, on our second month of being together, a storm hits us. Her grandmother, our Lola, um, was suddenly rushed to the hospital for all of these complications. She was a healthy uh, grandmother. She would always be with us. But in that hospital, a storm hit us. And you know how we responded? We responded in faith. Lord, you allowed this to happen. You are in control. Ultimately, our lives are not in our hands. It is in your hands. So what did we do? We were courageous. We stood firm. We used every day that she was in the hospital. Kahit na pagod na pagod na kami. We would be there every night. We would pray for her, share the word with her, share the gospel with her. And she passed away after a struggle of about 10 days. And it was tough for us. But we knew that God is in control. That nothing comes to pass without His permission. That even the storms of our lives are under His supervision. That He is in control. So what happens to Paul? What happens as they journey from Crete onwards? Well, they were supposed to go here onwards to Italy, Rome, and yet the wind brought them down south, going to this area called Sirtis Major. This was on the tip of North Africa today. They were blown off of their direction, upwards of about 1,000 kilometers away from their desired destination. And look at this. They hoisted it up. They used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis. Now, if you check your history, Sirtis was known, Sirtis Major was known for being a graveyard of ships. Mababaw po yung tubig doon. So when they hit that, you will run aground, right? So they were afraid and they let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. And the next day as they were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. Even the cargo of the ship, they began to throw it off board they, to make the ship lighter so that it can ride the waves smoother. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. This was the main sail, the device for the main sail with their own hands. So this was a desperate situation, and they were at their wit's end. And look at this. By the very end, neither sun, let's all read this together, nor stars appeared for many days. And by the way, wala pang compass nun. So the sun and the stars, that was their way of navigation, the moon, Right? And no small storm was assailing us. And let's all read this. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. They were lost. They had given up. In the darkest of days, their hope was gone. There seemed to be no rescue for them. This is it, they said. And I wonder for many Christians today, for many of us here, we are going into a storm. And then, you know, sometimes we get out of the storm alive. But then another storm hits us. And then another storm hits us. And then another, and then another, and then another. And then at the end of it, pagod na pagod ka na. And you're thinking to yourself, how can I move on? 
That's why, you know what? Many Christians today, they fall away. Because at the first onset of hardship, challenges, they just give up. Lord, why did you allow this to happen? Why did you allow this to happen, Lord? It's because we don't have a theology of suffering. We don't have an anchor of God's providence in the midst of our problems. That some Christians, they fall away at the first sign of trouble. So at this point, I want to ask you, what's the weather like in your life? Are you currently going through storms, emotional storms of anxiety, depression, and worry? Are there ongoing conflicts in your family amongst relatives, the never-ending pounding of financial problems? How are you going to take care of the bills? Or unforeseen accidents that caught you off guard? Is there pain and suffering over losing a loved one? Or that dreaded diagnosis of sickness or cancer, the treatment that goes along with it? My dear church, when your heart is being tossed back and forth, when all hope is lost, when you seem to have no direction to move forward, when you are in desperation, who can you rely on? When the weather in your life is raging on, I pray for all of us that we would not depend on our circumstances, but we would be anchored in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Can I get an amen? amen. Anyone needs to hear this today? Oh man, life can be discouraging, but thank God that we have God's presence in the midst of the storm. Isn't this the good news? That God is in your storm. Whatever you're facing today, you're not alone. God is with you in the midst of the difficulty. God's presence is with us, and He will never leave us nor forsake us. Why? Be courageous because God is in control. I remember Jesus and His disciples when they were in the Sea of Galilee. What happened? Do you remember that? A similar story like this? A storm all of a sudden arose upon them, and they were saying, whoa, we're going to perish. These are trained fishermen. And they said to Jesus, who was, by the way, sleeping, Sabi nila, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And Jesus wakes up in the middle of the storm, and what does he do? He rebukes the winds and the waves, and then all of a sudden, everything's calm. Wow, our God, our Lord, is the one in control. That even the winds and the waves, they obey him that He is Lord over the waves, over the storms. He is Lord over all. And I want you to know that if you're dealing with difficulties today, God is there with you. And God can control that storm. But more than that, He is with you through it. In fact, some of you are so Christ-like today that you are already sleeping in the midst of the storm. Okay? They're sleeping in the midst of the storm, right? They're so Christ-like, right? Now, as we move forward in our story, when they had gone a long time without food, wow, they weren't eating at all, Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice. This is Paul's moment, right? I told you so. And not to have set sail and incurred this damage and loss, but he doesn't end there. I don't think this is a gloat or, uh, uh, you know, a, a bragging sort of statement because he closes it with an encouragement. In verse 22, let's all read this together. Yet now, I urge you to keep up your courage. Be courageous. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He tells them no one will die. Why? How does he know this? It's because God told him. In verse 23, he says to all that is on board, for this very night, what? An angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. See, God's presence was made manifest. God sent an angelic being to give this message to Paul, to encourage them. And look at this. I love these words. To whom I belong and whom I Serve. We need to realize that in the midst of the storm, whose we are. Folks, that if you are in Christ, 
that He has your life, that you belong to Him, and that if you are serving Jesus, that even in the midst of the storm, He will take care of you, He will be with you. Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness that He is with us? And look at this. He said, do not be afraid, Paul. The angel said to him, you must stand before Caesar. This is the promise. This is the plan of God. And behold, God has granted you some, all those who are sailing with you. Not one of them will be lost. This is an incredible promise of God to Paul in the midst of the storm. I, it, I remember Charles Spurgeon once said in commenting on this passage, he said, O angel of my God, be near. Amid the darkness, hush my fear. The loud roars, the wild tempestuous sea, thy presence, Lord, shall comfort me. Sometimes in the midst of the storm, we can say to God, thy presence, Lord, it comforts me. That we can bring to our hearts Psalm 46, verse 10, which says, Be still and know that I am God, that He is in control. Be still. Sabihin nyo katabi nyo, be still. God is in control. He is God. That is God's promise. And we can stand on His very promises. For Paul, he was, about, he was to be a witness in Rome, and nothing will stop that, that God's promise will hold on until it is fulfilled. So, he says, therefore, let's all read this together. Keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. He believed every word that God said to him, but we must run aground on a certain island. See, how it is to stand on God's word. I praise God for the Dehesa family that even though they were in such a trial, they stood on God's word that God would provide. Biromo, 2.5 million pesos in six days? How are you going to do that? And if I, if I were them, I would, you know, go on Facebook, run a fundraiser, you know, rally all my friends. Oh, hey, help me, help me. No, they asked God. And that was enough. God provided, right? In the midst of the storm, God was the one who was faithful and true to his word. Look at this. Finally, when the 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the sea, they took soundings. They were measuring the depth of the sea. And look, they found it at 20 fathoms, which is about 120 feet. And then later on, another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms, about 90 feet. So they were slowly approaching land. Incredible. And so, fearing that they might run aground, look at this. How did the sailors respond to the storm. The sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat, this is the small boat, on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the boat. You see, I realized some people, the way that they respond to conflicts, trials, crisis, what do they do? They escape. They just, I, I don't want any part of that. I'm done. I'm done with God. I'm done with you guys. Any conflict in the family, yeah, bahala na kayo Any trouble at work, I quit, I resign. Any trial in the Christian walk, I I don't want to go to I don't want to go to church anymore. Some of us we escape. That's how we respond to the storm. And if these sailors escape, paano na yung mga crew? How about the rest of the passengers? And so Paul said to the centurion, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. So he must do something, right? In the midst of the promises of God, God's providence, Paul still acted upon that. He knew that God was in control, but he also played his part. You see, all these storms are out of our control. What is in our control is how we respond. And so, the soldiers then cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. And look what, the, what, what Paul does next. This is incredible. Until the day was about to dawn, this was pitch black in the darkness of night, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day 
that you have constantly been watching and going without eating. 14 days without eating, two weeks. They were ship, you know, they were navigating. And therefore, Paul encouraged them, take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. This is a saying that you will be protected, that none of you will perish, right? So Paul, being courageous, he was the one encouraging people. Right? And look at this. What happened next, having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. And he broke it and began to eat, and all of them were encouraged. And they themselves also took food. And there were how many? 276 people all in all. Can you imagine? In the midst of the storm and the rains and the waves, Paul was giving thanks to God. In front of all of the crew, 275 of them, hey, guys, let's share this meal together. Let's give thanks to God. And I realized how you can survive a storm is that you can thank God in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the storm. How many of us do we actually say to God, Lord, thank you for this storm. Thank you that we can rely on you. Thank you that we can depend on you. And this was Paul's example for us. And verse 38 says, when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship, throwing off the wheat into the sea. We gave, he gave thanks in the midst of the storm. It shows us that he was courageous. Because what? What's our message for today? God is in control. In fact, after being tossed about by the wind here, 1,000 kilometers away, now providentially, by God's guiding, look at this, they made their way to this small and tiny island of Malta. This is incredible. The probability of this is a needle in a haystack. That just doesn't happen if it were not for God being in total control. In fact, I calculated the distance. This is the same distance. If you were to travel from Manila, the port of Manila, and you will be sailing without a compass, and you will slowly find yourself in the island of Siargao, the same size of Malta. No motor, no compass, and you will just find yourself there. Boom. God's providence. God is in control. See? And when the day finally came, you see, there is a day that comes after the darkness. That in the midst of the storm, there will be the day that God breaks in. Look at this. They could not recognize the land, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. This is the shipwreck now. They ran across a reef or a sandbar, and the, the prow struck fast. The stern began to be broken up by the forces, by the force of the waves. So this was now the shipwreck. And look at how the soldiers respond. Look at this. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners. Bakit? If the prisoners escape by Roman rule, the guards who let them escape, the punishment of the prisoners will be upon them. So if these prisoners escape, these Roman guards will be the one to pay for it with their own lives. So that's why they said, Oi, let's kill these people before they escape. I realized some of us, when we are in crisis, we tend to take things into our own hands, right? We make plans. Let's do it our own way, right? This is how we get through this, right? And so these soldiers were planning to kill the prisoners. And yet, look at the providential care of God. The centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump aboard and the rest should follow. And it so happened that they all were brought safely to land. Is God good? Amen? Through the storm, through the shipwreck, they are delivered all to 76 of them, alive and well. Wow, God is amazing in bringing His, His promise, His plan, and His presence towards Paul in this journey. 
You see, many of us, we go through life, the problems, the storms, without even praying to God, without even waiting upon Him. Lord, what do you want me to do here? I don't want to take this into my own hands, Lord. I want to do this your way. I want to do it according to your plan. And finally, after the storm and after the shipwreck, now comes God's power in display. Look at this, God's power. Everyone say God's power. Paul's anchor in this time. Look at this. Finally, in Acts 28, when they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness. Wow, they were welcomed. And they kindled a fire and received us all. What a great fire that would have been, 276 of them, right? And look at this. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, now, hold on. After all of the shipwreck and all of the storms, Paul is still serving, right? He's gathering sticks to place into the fire. Look at the servant heart of this guy. When he had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a what? A viper came out. This is a venomous snake. It fastened itself on his hand. So imagine, well, you're like picking up sticks and then big, and then boom, there's a snake on your hand and it's fastened all over you. Look at this. I love how he reacts. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said, oh no, patay. They began saying to one another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. So they were believing that Paul, you know, he was spared from the storm, but now that he's alive, the snake has bitten him. This is their mythology. This is their fate, right? Their, their, their thinking and notion. And look at this. However, see Paul, I can just imagine it. He shook off the creature into the fire and what? Suffered no harm. Incredible. God preserved Paul's life even when he was bitten by a lethally poisonous snake. Ngayon, ingat kayo sa mga ahas, ha? Singles, can you see me? Singles, come on. Take care of those snakes that they don't fasten and hold upon you. Okay, God is in control. <laughs> All right? Now, as we wrap this up, they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead because they knew it. They experienced this beforehand. But after they had waited a long time, and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a God. They could not describe God's power upon Paul. They said, wow, this guy must be a God because he was bitten, but he's still alive. Wow, God is in control. That even Paul's life was preserved. And not only that, God's power was manifested in his life. Now, Look at this. It just so happened, again, God's providence, that the place where the lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, he was the governor of this island. And look at this. He entertained them courteously, and it just so happened. Look at this. It just so happened that on the tiny, tiny island of Malta, Publius' father was lying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. Dysentery, right? What is this? This is the Malta fever where the bowels were bleeding and it was a very tough case because of the hard times, you know, no sanitation in those times. So this guy was sick, very, very sick. The father of Publius was. And look at this, how Paul, in the midst of what he had just been through, showcases God's power. And Paul, let's all read this together went in to see him, and after he prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. So not only was Paul storm-tossed, shipwrecked, snake-bitten, but now he was being used by God in a powerful way to minister to the Maltese people. And you know, when I think about the storms of our lives as Christians, the way that you respond, the way that you display 
God's plan, His presence, and His promise, and more so His power is realized in how you respond. When you respond in total faith and trusting your life upon God, people will see, why are you responding this way? Napakahirap na ng pinagdadaanan mo, but yet, you're still joyful. You're still trusting upon God. That is God's power. Can I get an amen? God's power shines forth in our weakness that His strength will be displayed in every storm that we face. And it was true for Paul. In fact, it tells us that he stayed there for the winter, about three months. And after that time, I believe Paul ministered to these people because their response to him was, they honored us with many marks of respect. Wow. And when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all that we needed. I believe that Paul shared the gospel with these people, that he did not stop and just curing and healing the diseases, but that he shared God's plan, God's presence, God's promises, and ultimately God's power to these people. How about you? Is that evident in your life? That in the midst of the storms, God is with you? That you can walk on, that you can move forward, and that you can be what? Courageous, because why? God is in control. Praise God for how His people respond in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties. Again, how do we anchor and navigate through the storms of life? God's plan, God's presence always with us, God's promise, and God's power upon our lives. Do you believe that God can use your storm? Yes? Do you believe that God is leading you closer to Himself? Do you believe that you can be used by God to be a faithful witness? Yes. This is why, as Christians, we hold on to Him against all odds. Through storms, shipwreck, snake bites, and even sickness, we hold on to Him, for He is our anchor. And as I close, I want to share this verse with you all. Romans 8, verse 28 to 29. Let's all read this wonderful, beautiful verse. In fact, if you can memorize any verse, it would be this. Let's all read this. And we know, we know it, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That whatever you're facing today, whether it be good or bad, through the triumphs and the trials, through the failures and the successes, that He is weaving together, He is working together His purposes in your life, that it would turn out for good. Is God good or what? That even that storm today is within His command, that He is working all things according to His purpose. But this is for those who love Him, for those who are in Christ, for those who love God. And what is the ultimate good that God causes to work together? Is it financial stability, wealth? Is it health that we can be healed from our sicknesses? Yes, He can do that. But what if He chooses not to heal us? What if He, instead of taking away the storm, allows you to endure the storm? What is the good then that he is talking about here? Ultimately, we read verse 28, but we sometimes forget to read verse 29, that the ultimate good that God is working in and through our lives is this, that for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become, let's all read this together, conformed to the image of his Son. 
the ultimate good that God wants to bring about in our lives is that we would be Christ-like. That in the midst of our difficulties, in the midst of our darkest days, that we will show the world who we are because we are in Christ. That we are Christ-like in every situation. He is our anchor. And we're talking about God's providence. I want to close with this. That God's providence works today in our lives. But God's ultimate act of providence was something that he did 2,000 years ago. That as Hebrews 6, 9 says, this hope is what we have as an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. And that is none other than God's ultimate act of providence upon the cross of Jesus Christ. That 2,000 years ago, God provided His ultimate plan of salvation. That all of us who are imperfect and sinners, who deserve punishment, He has provided a way for us to be saved. And this is God's plan that He sent His only beloved Son to this earth so that He could live a life that we were supposed to live and that He would die the death that we were supposed to die that Jesus Christ on that cross would be crucified and that He would be the sacrifice, the substitute for us. And that God's promise would be for anyone who trusts upon the finished work of Christ on that cross, it is they who have eternal life. It is they who have forgiveness of sins. It is they who can enter into God's presence. It is they who have God's power. You see, the ultimate act of God's providence was in and through the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. In fact, there is a hymn writer, and I will end with this. He says this, Now I have found the ground wherein sure my soul's anchor may remain. The wounds of Jesus for my sin before the world's foundation slain, whose mercy shall unshaken stay when earth and sky are fled away. Fixed on the ground will I remain, though my heart fail and flesh decay. This anchor shall my soul sustain. When the earth's foundations melt away, mercy's full power I then shall prove love with an everlasting love. This is of God's providence, that God's providence carries us through. And God today is calling you to Himself. Today, as I close, there are only two people in this room. Only two people. The first group of people are those who are still weathering through the storm by themselves. They're self-sufficient. They're thinking they can do this on their own. They're believing the lies that they can take it into their own hands, that they can escape. But the second group of people, they believe in God, God's plan, God's promise, God's presence, God's power, and that they believe the truth. They hold it upon an anchor in their lives. The first group of people, they're still working their way as if the storms are God's punishment. But the second group of people, they believe by faith that God has allowed these storms to happen to them for a specific reason, for a purpose. The first group of people, they're still trying to earn merit from God. The second group of people, they know it is by grace and grace alone, something that we do not deserve. The first group of people, they are lost. They're carried away by the seas and the waves. The second group of people, they are saved. They are within God's hand and embrace. The first group of people, they quit. At the first onset of hardship, they're gone. The second group of people, they have courage because they know that God is in control. The first group of people, they're still living in the flesh. But the second group, are brought about by the Spirit 
of God. What is the difference between these two people? The first group, they reject God and His invitation. The second group, they receive God. They believe in God's providence. They entrust their lives upon God. They are anchored in the hope that God has provided. What is the difference between these two people? My dear brothers and sisters, it's none other than the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is our anchor in any storm. That even today, as you face difficulties, discouragements, you're on the verge of giving up, that God has you, that He is holding you, that ultimately, through the cross of Jesus, we are anchored in His salvation, in His forgiveness, and that is more than enough for us. In any storm, we can say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes as we close this service. Father God, today we stand before you and we thank you, like Paul, in the midst of the storm. We thank you, Lord, that in the storm, we see your plan unfolding. We realize that you're present with us, that we can depend upon your promises, and that your power is always available for us. So, Lord, we thank you that we can be courageous, that you are in control. And today, Lord, I want to pray for all of my friends here, whoever has come here, and maybe today you realize, hey, who is this Jesus? Maybe today you have not surrendered your life to Him. Maybe today you have not fully given Him the anchor to your soul. Then I pray that today you will not harden your heart, but instead you will listen to Him. That as He is drawing you near to Him, you will embrace Him, that you will receive Him, and that you will find Him as the anchor. So if today that is you, my dear friend, if today God is calling upon you to trust in Him, to turn away from your former way of life, to turn away from self-dependence, to turn away from your sin, to turn away from whatever you are depending on in the storm, that today you want to trust in Him and in Him alone, I encourage you, why don't you raise your hand? Anyone here today, that today is the day that you make Jesus the anchor for your soul in the midst of the storm. Any ra raise your hand, please. With all heads bowed down and every eye closed, raise your hand. Praise God. There are many in this room today that they're realizing their need of a Savior in the midst of the storm. In fact, if you're raising your hand right now, I want you to stand up. Stand up as we pray for you, as we want to invite you into this vital relationship with Jesus, that He is the anchor for our soul. Praise God. There are many standing up, praise God, and we will pray with you and for you. If you are seated and you want to pray for those around you, why don't you extend your hands over them and let us pray together over them. Father God, you see everyone standing here. More importantly, Lord, you see their hearts. You see how troubled they are. You see how difficult their situation is. And I pray, Lord, that in the midst of the storm today, they will find that you are mighty, that you are in control, that you are Lord over all. And today, Lord, we surrender our lives to you, that you are our Lord and our Savior, that you are the one who died for us on that cross. And on the third day, O oh Lord, you rose again to signify that now we trust in you we have forgiveness of sins. We have eternal life. And we shall forever be with you at the end of the age. Oh, Lord, thank you for those who have stood up. And today we pray for those who are in the midst of the storm, that they will realize that they can be strong, that they can be courageous in the midst of the storm because you, our God, are in control. We pray all of these things to the anchor of our souls, the author and perfecter of our faith, 
Jesus Christ, our mighty Savior and our Lord, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, who forever reigns in all the heavenlies and upon our lives. He is Lord of all. And it is in his powerful and beautiful name that we pray all of these things. And everyone said, amen and amen. Why don't we give God all that he deserves? Praise him, praise him today. God bless you.